Freedom Abolition is a video series that explores the theories and practical implications of anarchism using thought experiments. This video does not advocate illegal behavior or activities. It is merely a philosophical discussion about hypothetical scenarios. Welcome to another episode of Freedom Abolition. On this episode, I want to talk about if judicial systems could exist inside of an anarchist society. Uh, if so, what might that look like? Um, why would a judicial system be relevant, a court system be relevant? So, in other videos, I talked about the non-aggression principle and retaliation for acts of uh, destruction, alteration, or theft of property. Also, the non-aggression principle is concerned with uh, acts of aggression against people. All anarchist theories in general are concerned with acts of aggression, acts of coercion, and acts of violence from one individual or structure against another individual. In fact, a trained anarchist thought defines the state as the authorization to use violence. Some, some theories go further to define the institution of a state as being professional in nature, etc. But all anarchist theories are unified in that the state is an actor that has the authority to use violence and uh, violent coercion, the threat of violence to coerce people, etc. So some philosophies of anarchism, like the anarcho-communists, for instance, believe in the violent overthrow of uh, systems of capitalism. They believe in theft as a form of reappropriation. They believe in the destruction of tools which could empower systems of capitalism and individuals who wish to obtain power and advantage over over others. Almost all anarchists believe in the use of violence to overthrow any systems of government if a government is trying to impose itself upon society. So in any cases, if there are incidences of what might be considered acts of aggression, then uh, there needs to be some system to determine if the allegation has any integrity. If somebody claims that an act of aggression was carried out against them, uh, there needs to be some mechanism for determining if they really have a justification to retaliate. Again, the anarcho-capitalists and anarcho-communists, etc., uh, green anarchists, they have differing views about what constitutes violence and aggression. Like the anarcho-communists and the green anarchists believe in industrial sabotage. Um, they believe in theft, destruction of property, etc. They don't believe in property rights generally. Uh, the, the communists don't believe in property rights generally. The green anarchists believe in uh, sabotage to destroy all forms of industry. And anarcho-capitalists believe that any acts against someone's property is an act of aggression against themselves. And, and that, to them, justifies retaliation. So if there were any conflicts between anarcho-capitalists, anarcho-communists, green anarchists, anarcho-capitalists, etc., then, then you could see how a problem could arise about whose interpretation of aggression will prevail. Uh, does somebody have the ability to retaliate? If they retaliate, is the, if the retaliation wasn't justified, is the retaliation actually considered the act of aggression? And then further retaliation is justified against that that supposed act of retaliation. So there, there needs to be some, some mechanism within society and it'll probably be differing uh, mechanisms between different segments of society to determine what constitutes the act of aggression, who's in the right, who has the justification to retaliate. And further, in the case of anarcho-communists, even a, a green anarchists, etc., those anarchists that don't uh, believe in property and define it the way that the anarcho-capitalists do, it is still undeniable that certain acts of destruction of property, theft, etc., should be considered acts of violence against persons. Um, those are the cases in which you destroy property or steal property from somebody that they're immediately relying on for their survival. Like, say, if you take something from somebody that they will literally starve and die. Um, or, you know, like I say, if you take somebody's water, they will not be able to go without the water for a day or more than a day without suffering severe consequences and potentially dying. If you steal somebody's food and they have no other source of food, then that, that most likely should be considered a direct act of aggression against the person. So other acts against property, like say in the case of industrial sabotage or in the case of theft against very wealthy property owners, those don't have any immediate consequence that could cause the owners of the property to starve. Those who are somehow relying on the property, it would not immediately cause them to starve. They would at least have some time to recoil and recover losses, etc., change their patterns of behavior in order to continue survival. 
those are the cases in which anarcho-communists and uh, like green anarchists, etc., they they would not consider those type of activities uh, justifying any form of retaliation against them. They would perceive those acts as being for the good of society. So everybody has different opinions. Everybody will have different opinions, no matter how prevalent you think any of your theories will be in a system of anarchism. Generationally, your ideals will will fade away. Your morals will become diffuse uh, among society, and people will adopt differing opinions about how things should be in society. So um, in order to deal with this, probably the best method would be the use of court systems and trials. As we have now, the, the court systems have evolved over time to be fair and impartial. There is no necessity to couple a court system with a police force or uh, corrections systems. The court systems can be used merely to provide information, to analyze controversial incidents uh, as they happened, and provide rulings and verdicts as to what actually happened in the situation, what are recommended consequences based on uh, prior situations that society has been through, based on agreements that society has set up between different segments of society, etc., etc. This information could simply be used by free people to act how they will. Say, within consensus, they might have a portion of consensus where they would meet on all the different verdicts that had come to light and decide what to do about them. If they, they might just decide to do nothing, it depends. That's one, of the, that's one of the strengths of a system of anarchism is that you're able to more fluidly respond to changing circumstances within society and within the environment and react more quickly than uh, governments can. And to avoid the introduction of institutional corruption into your systems of decision making. So as I said, one thing all anarchists agree on is that one aspect of the state is the authorization to use violence and the act of violence in itself against another individual or an act of coercion uh, against the other another individual against that individual's will can constitute an instantiation of the state or uh, state-like behavior on behalf of the aggressor and given that interpretation of this kind of behavior society may may decide that the the elimination of the aggressor or the mitigation of the aggressor's behavior might be in order uh, to prevent the rise of uh, state power within society and so to determine what is an act of aggression and who was the aggressor a court system would be very appropriate and a system of trials would be very appropriate to make this ruling so acts of retaliation against supposed aggressors may not be considered to have justification before a court ruling has taken place to prove that there was in fact an act of aggression and to make recommendations about what kind of retaliation may be appropriate if there is any that would be appropriate and again in a system of anarchism society would have no obligation to carry out any recommendations made by a court system although different segments of society may be subjected to rules of federation which I'll explain in other videos. Again, this idea of federation is a recurring theme in the videos as a strategy for the mitigation of violence between groups, as a federation is essentially a system of treaties between different groups to prevent war from breaking out between them. So anyway, acts of retaliation may not be considered to have justification before a court ruling on the triggering incident has processed. Otherwise, society would have no way to know what actually happened during the incident that was in question and no way to believe any one person's account of the incident. And if they didn't have that information, there would be no way to know who was justified in any acts of retaliation. So what would most likely happen within an anarchist society is the systems of handling any kind of incidents of supposed aggression would probably have to go through uh, court proceedings first before any kind of retaliation could occur or else the the one who performed the act of retaliation could be subject to exclusion from society, exclusion from any federal agreements, and could be subject to further retaliation from the community, etc. Whether that be in the form of violence against their persons, in the form of confiscation of property which they may have stolen or may have taken, or confiscation of property to repay any damages, etc. All of this might seem similar to what we consider law. There would be nothing within an anarchist society, by definition, that could be considered law. And people would act based on the practicality of the situations. So, that, so there needs to be some mechanism for determining what is practical, what is appropriate, etc. in the situations. 
for an anarchic society to function and to sustain itself. So components of uh, court systems and judicial systems would most likely be the same as they are today in advanced societies which have developed integrity within their judicial systems. They you know, would contain judges, professional judges that would most likely be elected by society, potentially re-elected by society periodically. Judges would be professional. They would be experts on rules of federations, etc., histories of judicial rulings, his, the mechanics of judicial systems and methods of conducting trials. As such, society would probably compensate people to perform this role. The societies would need some, some mechanism to certify that these, uh, that these people actually had the knowledge and expertise to perform the function. Courts would obviously use juries that were impartial and were representative of the diversity of society and the diversity of individuals involved in any incident in question. There would be clerical staff that keep the courts running. These would be also professionals probably employed by society, although they may perform other roles within society. Given that systems of anarchism would probably have much different, potentially radically different economies than what we're used to today, one very important duty of court staff would be to preserve the records of the proceedings and the court rulings. Society would probably have lawyers by profession, although technically there would be no such thing as law in an anarchistic society. Uh, lawyers would be experts in court proceedings and may be hired or provided by the courts to achieve the best outcomes for the defendants and the plaintiffs and to represent large groups of people. Representatives from different communities would probably be involved to receive confidential information from the courts in cases which necessitate the protection of victims' identities, the identities of the defendants, also to represent communities in the trials, and otherwise to disseminate information back to the affected communities. Further, anarchic societies would need to maintain some kind of judicial infrastructure to interface with outside states and societies that aren't, aren't necessarily anarchic in nature. So instead of verdicts and judgments being acted upon by law enforcement agencies, they could simply be provided as information for the free society to work with. These would essentially serve as records of the truth with greater integrity than arbitrary accounts of individuals who may have motives. Depending on the circumstances of the incidents in question and the ways that free societies might work with these that don't involve the use of authority or the same kind of authoritative methods we associate with governments and the state, these societies could use the information provided by the courts to set up systems of physical security infrastructure to identify perpetrators and use that as information to keep surveillance on these individuals if they are deemed a risk to society. Like in the case of convicted thieves, uh, pedophiles, other types of aggressors, particular segments of society which could be affected by these people may decide to keep a record of the, uh, of the convict's identity and to set up barriers to their ability to perpetrate further crimes of the same nature. Like the convicts may be excluded from taking jobs that put them in situations that they can perpetrate further crimes. Pedophiles, for instance, like wouldn't be allowed to do anything that puts them in contact with children uh, outside of some kind of supervision of, of, of other members of the society. Um, thieves may not be allowed to manage product or money. Um, violent aggressors may not be allowed to lead the surveillance of other individuals or to acquire access to weapons. Physical security infrastructure like locks on doors, bars on windows, uh, security alarms, metal detectors, etc., and also forms of surveillance, uh, which may not need to rely on techno technology like even like night watches, etc., uh, may be employed to protect society instead of the use of police. Along with rigid education about these systems of surveillance and these systems of security to all the members of society, anybody who wishes to leave the safety of the security infrastructure could leave at their own risk. And this would be understood by society. So if they were a uh, victim of some further of some further act of aggression, then society might say, you know, it, it was their essentially they, they had taken the risk. They knew what they were risking and police might not need to be involved. Different segments of society will probably have different ways of dealing with these type of problems. And there may be acts of retaliation justified by society against any perpetrators of any crimes, anything which might be considered an act of aggression. And the reality of most economic circumstances would be that uh, any physical security systems would most likely have finite boundaries. Uh, you wouldn't be able to protect against everything. People would have to take risks 
uh, in order to uh, get certain things done. If people wanted to achieve higher levels of freedom, they would need to take uh, certain risks. And if you think about status societies, people do still take risks every single day. It's not like this would be something necessarily that would be less safe than what we have nowadays. It could potentially be even more safe without the inclusion of police. If people were able to build systems of security infrastructure strategically enough to provide protection uh, nearly universally, like for instance, there are still many murders that occur within society. Uh, there are still many acts of theft, rape, uh, child molestation, etc. People are able to enter into areas that experience large amounts of traffic. People are able to take weapons, other objects that could be used as weapons, into areas where there are large amounts of traffic. Like anybody could drive a car into a crowd any day. There's really nothing to prevent that in society. Um, people could take guns to many different places. There's not much to protect that. Even with gun control laws, arguably, you'll have many criminals and people who acquire weapons outside of the system will still be able to use them against people in society, even even if there were gun control laws, laws that controlled the ability of people to access weapons. Okay, so I just want to provide some further background here uh, when I talk about gun control and how violent crime could still occur even if there is a system of gun control in place. I don't mean to discredit the idea of gun control. In fact, it may be a, a good solution for a statist society to implement some form of gun control. And even if anarchist societies, you may end up with the, effectively the same outcome as gun control would achieve inside of a state society. But what I'm saying is that even with restrictions on uh, gun ownership and the ability to obtain guns, uh, people would still be able to operate at some extent through the black market. It would probably be a small extent. And further, people would be able to obtain or create other weapons like bombs, uh, blades, poisoning, acid attacks, etc. Many things can be used as weapons. What I'm trying to illustrate here is that with a focus on physical security rather than using police violence to solve these problems, physical security systems may be better at preventing all forms of violence, even if there are guns that somehow manage to get into society or if people are able to construct other, other weapons, etc. If society were restructured through, through different systems of economy and physical security was built, uh, people may be actually much safer and may live in circumstances that completely prevent these forms of attacks from happening. And police forces are mostly reactive to situations after they occur. That there is not substantial proof that they can prevent more crimes from happening than you could in the absence of a system of violent policing. Schools aren't equipped with metal detectors and often will have very lax security. Anybody could come in with a knife or improvised weapon. Uh, somebody could create a bomb if they wanted to. People could drive cars very easily into crowds of students outside of schools. It's the security, if you want to take an honest look at society, security is very minimal. And this may be a symptom of how society has structured itself economically, which is another dynamic of systems of anarchism that may solve these problems uh, structurally rather than through the use of authority. So one might ask, in the absence of state, how is a court and judicial institution established and known to be respectable and known to have integrity? Um, I would argue that multiple court systems could spontaneously arise and, uh, or through acts of uh, consensus among individuals. Uh, society would be able to very easily rationally solve this type of problem and set people up to perform these functions and preserve records of these institutions to, in order to identify which ones have integrity, which ones don't have integrity. Arguably many court systems provided by states have no integrity, actually, or very little integrity. They act against society's best interest like in the case of kangaroo courts for dictators, etc. So within a system of anarchism, you could say if there's nothing preventing somebody from establishing a court system, although people would most likely set these up very deliberately, there could be multiple court systems that would compete against each other. Certain segments of society could use the information from the different that the different courts produce to determine uh, which ones have the greatest integrity like you know if there are records of the court proceedings, how they conduct their trials, etc. The how um, how transparent they were. The information the courts produce could be compared against information that journalists from the public uh, are able to produce. And through this active analysis, people can determine which courts have uh, the most integrity. Uh, certain court systems can lose their integrity over time. New court systems 
can arise which uh, have greater integrity. So ultimately, you probably would have better a better system, a more robust system than than systems that states have provided, in which court systems that have, have lost their integrity are still forced upon the public through the institution of the state. So furthermore, one might ask, in a system of anarchism, wouldn't it be considered an act of aggression to hold somebody against their will in order to conduct a trial concerning an incident in which they are involved? Perpetrator of any supposed incidents would not be required to be present in trials. The only reason that courts are involved in the detainment of individuals is if they are deemed a risk by society. And, in that, and, and when that happens, the court's role is simply to determine whether or not the individual is a risk to society and to authorize police to perform the detention of the individual. Courts do not need to detain an individual in order to conduct a trial. The evidence will all still be there. Everybody who wants the trial to proceed will be there. They can assemble a jury without the person being present. All they need to do is provide the information on what actually happened in the incident and then allow society to handle that information however they think is best. One might argue, also argue that the use of judicial systems would be contradictory to anarchist philosophies in that the use of rulings and potentially malicious rulings could be used to enact structural violence against the convicts according to the verdict. Yes, this could be a problem, but again, to consider what I said earlier, society would be aware of which courts have integrity and thus which verdicts have integrity to believe and to act upon. As far as the ability for society to carry out acts of structural violence against individuals, right. like depriving them of employment in places which they should still be allowed to work, there are other strategies which anarchist societies can resort to to prevent the formation of structures within society. Um, if you're allowing structures within society that, to form that, that have the potential to perpetrate acts of structural violence, that's the problem in the first place, and that, that can be solved through other methods. Furthermore, you might think there could be problems if there is no authority that's obligated to protect the information the courts produce. What about the privacy of victims? What about the privacy of participants in the trial, etc.? This this is a realistic problem, I would think. Um, it would really be up to society to handle this information with integrity. And you can imagine segments of society which don't handle information like this with integrity would probably fail. There could be also rules of, uh, again, federation, uh, rules of federation between different segments of society that uh, that do obligate uh, the members of the federation to protect this information and, and abide by certain rules and certain protocols in order to uh, in order to maintain their membership within the federation, uh, otherwise be subject to invasion by the rest of the federation. So it's in any segments of society's best interest to preserve the privacy of any individuals involved in, in the trials. Some might argue that the institution of anarchism and the methods of consensus and uh, communal living, etc., the abolition of state violence would be enough to prevent members of society from committing anything which would constitute crimes and committing any acts which would even justify any use of judicial systems, so why would you even bother? We already have examples of societies in history which have acted on these uh, on similar beliefs, most notably the communists in Soviet Russia, the USSR, were directly influenced by Marxism. Marxists claimed that crime would die out under socialism and communism, um, and there would be no need for police forces. From what I understand, and I, I wasn't able to find any resources on this, but uh, from what I understand, the communists uh, were very lax on their police forces in, in regards to enforcing certain laws, and there were um, incidents of serial killers, etc., that were able to commit crimes for very long periods of time without being caught. We can't know exactly what happened because a lot of the information wasn't released from the Soviet Union, but if you research the case of Andrei Chikatilo, you could see that this would be a very big mistake to assume that uh, members of society would simply not commit crimes, uh, not commit egregious acts of aggression simply because of this, the structure of society. Although the structure of society may mitigate a lot of problems and prevent many acts of aggression from happening, you still need some system to deal with it when it, when it does happen because, because human beings are by nature vulnerable to mental disease, mental disorder, the effects of psychopathy, other disorders, which can make people very dangerous, need to be taken into consideration, and there will be no solutions to this, uh, at least not through the institution of a different system of society or a different system of economy. So that's the end of this video. Um, I'm no expert on judicial systems, court systems. I mean, I know as much as anybody, so 
please leave comments below if you have anything to add to the discussion, if you have, have any refutations of what I said, if you think I missed anything, if you think my analysis of the situation is flawed. You know, I, I, don't, I don't fully understand the history of court systems, et cetera, the full, fully the mechanisms of court systems, et cetera. Again, any feedback will be appreciated. I can reply to the feedback in further videos and clarify problems that people have brought up, uh, which I'm sure there will be problems people will bring up so anyways, as a reminder, this series is intended to contribute to the existing theory out there uh, surrounding anarchism and to be, used, to be used as background for other political theories and political decisions, economic decisions to be based on, as I think anarchistic societies represent the epitome of freedom and the influence of nature upon human society. So I think analyzing societies in this light can cause many reflections on other existing uh, political theories and systems of law and governance, etc., so please like the video if you found it useful, subscribe, you know, I'm not trying to manufacture authenticity here or whatever, I'm just uh, trying to remind people, you know, this is a mechanism that if you want this information to proliferate across the internet and become visible to as many people as possible, that will help it happen. So as always, thanks for watching my video and never stop thinking. Peace.